Okay, welcome back, everyone. We haven't quite finished Genesis chapter 12. We do have a handout that depicts the journeys of Abraham, or at this point, still Abram, from Ur to Canaan, to Egypt, back to Canaan. Um, you'll, you'll see it in the, in the map. But again, to help you conceptualize where we are in the world, how, how these places are related geographically, the map is going gonna, is gonna to help us with that. Let's open with prayer. Lord God, you promised to your servant Abram that his descendant would inherit the world that, that you have uh, promised to him. And through your son, Jesus Christ, indeed, he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Bless us then as we study the scriptures that testify of him, that we may not only see him, but know him, in whose name we pray. Amen. It, it's easy to skip over the, 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 the place names. So we're ready for, for I think, verse 10. Genesis 12, 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, You are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So, Abram is a herdsman. He has his herds, his flocks, and there's a famine, so he can't remain where he is. Where he is at this point is still Canaan, right? Why do we call the land Canaan? Because isn't Canaan the name of a man? Who is Canaan, by the way? Son of Ham, the son of Ham, right? The cursed one. His descendants will live in the land that the Lord promises to Abram. They will be given to profound wickedness, of course. And we're going to see that all throughout the Old Testament from here on out. So Abram is in the land that the Lord has promised to him. From this point on, we can call it the promised land. Because the Lord did indeed promise this land to Abram and his descendants. And... He's going to have to go down to Egypt. Abram's going to have to go down to Egypt because of the famine. Right? One thing about animals, uh, they got to eat. So they, they drive on down to Egypt. And what's, what's Abram's fear? They're going to kill him because his wife is pretty. How does that make any sense? Take kill the husband, take the wife. It doesn't really go much deeper than that, right? <laughs> not, not, not all the questions are hard ones, right? So, yeah, it's, it's an old story. So, we're going to be these two foreigners, because remember, he's, he's from Ur. Where's Ur? Yeah way down toward the corner of the map. Now, why, when, when Abram goes to Canaan, why doesn't he just make a straight line? Yeah. Well, if you walk through that desert, you die and your animals die. The route that he takes allows him to keep his herds. He's following the rivers, right? And rivers have water and they also have vegetation. So that's, that's why he doesn't just make a beeline straight for, straight for Canaan. 
e even one man traveling alone would be hard pressed to provide for himself. But for him and his wife and Lot and their herds, he's going to follow the river. So now he's in Canaan. He's going down to Egypt. But don't let him know you're my wife. Now, this is, this is coming from one or both of two places. On the one hand, Abram fears for his life. Rightly so. Because Sarai is described both by him and by the Egyptians as beautiful. She's 65 and she's still so beautiful that He's afraid they're going to kill him. So she, she's, she's a very beautiful woman. And everybody knows it. And so he's afraid they're going to kill him. On the other hand, he also knows the blessing the Lord gives will come through his descendant, his seed. And for that reason, he knows he must remain alive. So is it one? Is it the other? Is it both? We're not exactly told. Okay, um, continuing. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. There's that old country song about it's kind of like a lost and found at a border town asking about a diamond ring. You, you roll into Egypt with a beautiful wife from, from you know, out of country and everybody take, I mean, you can almost see all of Egypt taking notice as they walk into town. Like, who's that? It's kind of how it's described. All the Egyptians notice. Now, they think she is his sister. That's half actually true. We haven't learned that yet. But later on in the Bible, um, I don't know if the statute of limitations is for spoilers, but even if it's 3,000 years, we're still good. Um, she is his half-sister. So it's, it's, it's a half-lie, it's a half-truth, which for you parents, that, that's a lie. But <laughs> so... Because the Egyptians think she is his sister, instead of killing him, they're doing what? They're buttering him up. Why? Because if, if he's her brother, then if they get in, in good with him, maybe he'll be willing to give his sister to them. That's what they think. Now, so they all take notice of Sarai. They're, they're lavishing gifts upon Abram. The problem, of course, is that Abram is not free to give Sarai to them. Why? She's his. She belongs to him, not to, not to be given to anybody else. But Abram permits it because, one, again, he knows he has to remain alive. But two, um, he's, he's afraid. It's, it's not unimportant to make the point because when you consider the heroes of the faith, and Abraham is one of the consummate heroes of the faith, they are faithful. They do great works by faith. They are counted among the saints. Their works do follow them. The church rightly praises God for them, but that doesn't mean that they're always going to be right or always going to be perfect. And Abram is one example of hundreds. That on the one hand, he's counted among the saints. His faith is legendary. It's, it's the faith by which we, we all come to understand justification by faith because of what Moses writes about Abraham's faith. And yet, here he is. He's afraid of the Egyptians. Which, So in other words, if, if he's fearing the Egyptians, is he really fearing the Lord? Maybe not. Yeah, and, and, and like anything else, this can be taken too far the other way, 
where we, we take our ancestors and we yank them down off the pedestal and we smash them and we, we whine about, the world is so broken and there's, there's, it, it's full of brokenness. Man, I'd like to excise that word, but whatever. Um, they, they act like the saints are these utterly wicked men. They just are not. But they're not sinless either. And here you have an example where Abram is afraid of the Egyptians. He's fearing them. He's not fearing God. It's, it's the most natural thing in the world of the flesh because you can see other men. You can't see God. So it's natural to fear men because there they are in front of you. But God is not seen. And so you put him out of mind. Problem is putting God out of mind doesn't like erase God. God still is. And he sees all. So this, this, is, this is a great lesson to take from Father Japheth and Father Shem, right? We see the nakedness of Father Abraham, or Abram, rather than yank him down and just, just tear him into nothing, we can say, yeah, this is a moment of weakness. Let's learn from it, right? And so the Lord causes these things to be written for our instruction. I mean, they're written because they happen, sure. They did happen. All this did happen. But it's written down for us. I mean, you're exactly right. It's written for our instruction. We're supposed to learn from this. The Lord redeems sinners. The point of showing their sin is not to say, ah, Abram's not really as good a person as you think he is. It's not that. It's rather to show God saves sinners. And here's an example. Because even when Abram is not always so faithful to God, the Lord remains faithful to his promises. Okay, verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So, At some point, Pharaoh comes to know that she's his wife. And Pharaoh had taken her for his his wife. Where were you, Abram? Tale as old as time. Where were you, Adam? Where were you, Abram? On and on, right? Um, Because Abram let it go on way too long. And so, at some point, Pharaoh comes to find out She's his wife. Now, I find this fascinating because when you think of like Eastern kings, I don't think of people that are honoring the estate of marriage all that much. (laughs) You know, oh, I, I suckered this guy out of his wife. But Pharaoh, I mean, this Pharaoh anyway, it's not going to remain true of all Pharaohs, but this Pharaoh, once he finds out that She's his wife. He gives her back. Now, this is, of course, aided by what? Plagues. (laughs) Not entirely selfless. There are great plagues. And, of course, you can see foreshadowing, right? Um, Abraham sojourning in in Egypt. He belongs in in Canaan, but he's down in Egypt because of a famine. There in the house of Pharaoh. Um, Plagues are coming upon Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to tell Abraham to get out, right? You can see tremendous foreshadowing uh, events of the book of Exodus, right? So take your wife, take her and go. So they leave with all that they had. Notice they're not sent away poor. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negeb. Okay, where's the Negeb? Yeah, southernmost part of Canaan. And by the way, sometimes your Bible might say, and sometimes your modern map might say Negev. The reason, and this is this happens all the time in Hebrew, B and V kind of coincide a lot because this is B and this is V. It's the other one, isn't it? Right. 
right? So it's it's actually kind of the same letter, just one one bit of punctuation changes it from a B to a V. So they're going down to the Negeb. What do we know about the Negeb? Desert? Out of the frying pan into the fire, right? Yeah, that's where the Daimona plant is. Um, yeah, that's where, right. That's not till the 1960s, though, so we're, we're good for now. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. We talked before, when we got to the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, about how the Bible makes generalizations. The Bible does make generalizations. God makes generalizations. And generalizations are true when you take them as they are intended, right? For example, men have two legs. Yeah, but I know this guy that doesn't have two legs. Okay, but that doesn't actually change the fact that men have two legs, right? Bearing that in mind, the Bible makes lots of generalizations about wealthy people, about rich people. And those generalizations are that they are prone to greed and that it is difficult for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because mammon is easily the most common idol that men make for themselves. However, that generalization is true as a generalization. But the Bible is replete with examples of people who are wealthy, some of them shockingly wealthy, who use that wealth in service of God and righteousness. Abram is one of them, right? Abram is, is described as being a very wealthy man. However, he's not described as being particularly greedy. And here with the, this incident with Lot, his nephew, we're going to see his generosity. Um, there are other examples. Job is described as a man of great wealth. When the wealth is taken away, he, his faithfulness is proven. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea has a newly dug tomb. That could not have been cheap. He loans it to Jesus. I'd say gives, but uh, he gets it back. <laughs> Just as clean as he got it, too. Can you believe that? You better believe that, but... Um... <laughs> So, Abram is described as being rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Right? A wealthy man. Verse 3. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. So, Abram and Lot decide they need to spread out. Which, by the way, is precisely the thing God commanded man to do in the first place, right? Spread out. Don't gather at the planet Shinar. Spread out. And they were both rather wealthy. You can't, you can't have these herds that are grazing like right on top of each other. That they deplete the land. Um, and so they're going to spread out. Also, their herdsmen were getting into fights together, and so they really needed to push apart. But notice, this is not done in, in a spirit of animosity. It's, it's done in a peaceful spirit, right? Let's, let's spread out so that we can exist by ourselves and not be in constant conflict. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. So again, Abram here is, he's being the bigger man. He wants this to be peaceful. Brotherly, but a separation, right? Not unimportant that sometimes for peace, peoples need to be separated. Not to put too fine a point on it, 
but national borders come from God. It's Acts 17, 26. Right? Um, that's very much on people's minds these days. But it is, it's a godly principle. You can't have peoples living on top of each other. The, the, the command was to spread out. And the Lord puts borders between the nations for a reason. So, Abram wants this to be peaceful, spread out. But he gives Lot the choice. Now, Abram's the uncle. And he's the one who's wealthy. So he could have taken the, the, the choice place for himself. He doesn't. He lets Lot pick. Right? So, if you go this way, I'm going to go that way. If you go that way, I'm going to go this way. Verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not being written as it happens, right? It's being written by Moses long after. Yeah, it, right. In, in Moses' day, people were thinking Sodom and Gomorrah, like those aren't even places anymore. Those are, those are craters. Well, so, so Moses interjects, this was before all of that. They weren't craters then. And by the way, uh, you can find YouTube videos of this too. If you go to those lands now, you can still find chunks of sulfur. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now, did Lot pick Sodom because of the wickedness of the men? There's, it, it, it seems though, as though it was fertile, but I'm not sure I'd rule it out either. But, but it, it, it is described as being fertile. And so that's where Lot's going to be. He's toward Sodom, and Abram's going to be in the land of Canaan. Lot does exercise a bit of greed because it, it, it seems as though this is the better land. Plus, in Canaan, you already have the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelling there. And so Abram's going to be contending with them. Verse 14, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So, this is again another covenant the Lord coming and making a promise to Abram. And notice, what does Abram have to do to earn this covenant? He doesn't, right? This is grace. What's our technical definition of grace? Undeserved favor. If it were deserved, it would be wages. It would be earnings. It would be income. It's not. It's God's favor given to man, not because of anything man has done to earn it, but only because of God's love. If you want to say unearned love, that, that's great, that works too. Um, but, but the whole point is that it's, it's not deserved. So the Lord comes down to Abram, and he says, look around you, look north, look south, east, west. All the land that you see I'll give to you and your offspring forever. And then I'll make your offspring as the dust of the earth. Which means what? It's not a threat. <laughs> it's, it's not I'm going to turn them into dust. I'm going to make them as numerous as the dust. So, there is a massive inheritance waiting for all the sons of Abram or Abraham. The question is, who is the son of Abraham? That question, it may not be the central question, but it under, underlies the central question of the scripture. 
who inherits this promise. Turn to John chapter 8. So John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now again, I mean, talk about complete ignorance of history. The number of times their forefathers have been enslaved, I mean, as long as your arm, right? But, right. And, and yet Jesus is talking about a different kind of slavery. This is not slavery to Babylon or Assyria. This is slavery to sin, right? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Now, Jesus says, if you abide in my word. And the Jews who had believed in him say what? And by the way, that's, that's had, not were believing in him. But at one point had, but now are not. They answered him, we're sons of Abraham. By what? By birth, by blood, right? So Jesus is saying, if you abide in my word, and they're saying, we have Abraham in our, in our ancestry.com, right? We can trace back to Abraham through our bloodline. Big whoop. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Now, does that mean that Jesus' father and these Jews' father was different? That's precisely what it means, right? They have a different father. That's why when we say our father, we don't mean all mankind. We mean the father of all who believe, right? There are many people for whom God is not their father. Jesus is going to make this clear in a second. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. So, if you were implies what? You're not. If you were Abraham's children, in other words, big deal. You have Abraham's Y chromosome in your, in your men. Who cares? If you were really his children, you'd be, doing my, you'd be holding on to my word, and you're not. Right? But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Now, Jesus doesn't think Abraham is sinless. He's God. He's omniscient. He knows everything. But Abraham did not try to kill Jesus. Um, but that's what they're doing. You are doing the works your father did. So whoever their father is, they're doing the works of their father, which are not the works Abraham did. And then look at this blasphemy. It, it can't stand. They say, we were not born of sexual immorality. That is low. They, they are denying the virgin birth. They are denying that Mary was innocent. Yeah. The blasphemy of the highest order. We have one father, even God. Talk about blasphemy. Jesus has one father, even God. <laughs> right. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and, I, and I'm here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. And then look at verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do, to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. He's very rough on them because they thought, we don't need to worry about God's word or listen to this prophet Jesus because we have Abraham's blood in our veins. 
Like that automatically makes us in good with God. And Jesus, who, by the way, also has Abraham's blood in his veins, doesn't seem to think that counts for very much at all. Because if you were really Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did, namely things like building an altar to the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord, obeying the words of the Lord. They're doing none of these things. In fact, they're trying to killing, they're, they're trying to kill not only a prophet of the Lord, they're trying to kill the Lord himself. In fact, they, they will. Um, I hope that's not a spoiler, but they, they do. So, you have in, in America these Sunday schools filled with kids who are not blood descendants of Abraham singing about Father Abraham. Should they be doing that? Of course they should. But how is it that these Japhethite kids are sons of Abraham? Adopted by faith. Yes. To be a son of Abraham is to believe, right? All who believe in the Lord are Abraham's descendants by adoption and therefore stand to inherit the inheritance prepared for Abraham and his descendants, right? So I'm guessing that most of us are not descended from Abraham. I'm, I know I only trace my heritage back like a thousand years, but I'm going to go ahead and call it, I'm probably not descended by blood from Abraham. But I am a son of Abraham, as you are too, because we believe in the God of Abraham. Well, and, and it plays out in the New Testament, but it also plays out in the 21st century. Because we are surrounded by Christians who are, who are what? Dispensationalists. And dispensationalists have a proclivity to think that being a son of Abraham through blood may actually constitute a separate covenant. Most of them will reject that outright. But the idea is that somehow people who are descended by, by blood through Abraham are somehow closer to God than those who are descended from Abraham by faith. It's a tremendous heresy. It is everywhere. It is very hard to combat. That's now? That's now. That's been true for about 120 years, and it's intensifying. We talked about it when, um, a little bit when we studied dispensationalism in this class it must have been four years ago or so. Um, we talked about it in Galatians as well. We're going to keep talking about it because we're surrounded by it all the time. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedorleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma. Shemeber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the, in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had, sure, they had served Chedorlaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim at Ashtaroth Karanim, Karnaim, I'm sorry, and the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shava Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far, far as El Paran, on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. So you get the idea this is a... <laughs> you get the idea this is a very warlike place, right? You've got alliances, you've got regional wars going on, Verse 8, then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out. And they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elisar. Four kings against five. This is kind of an east versus west thing, right? Because you've got, you've got Shinar in the east. And you've got kings in that area. 
And then you've got the West with the, the regional kings from, from here, right? Uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, those are more West. Um, I don't know if they had blue and red colors to identify themselves. Uh, probably different record companies representing them, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, this, this is an East Coast, West Coast battle, right? Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fell into the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their, or their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. So the battle doesn't really have much to do with our, our story at all, with this giant exception that in the midst of all of this back and forth, Lot gets taken captive, right? Lot being Abram's nephew, he's, he's now taken captive because he's, he's dwelling in, in around the lands of Sodom. And of course, the king of Sodom is caught in this, this regional war. And so as, as his kings are routed, the invading kings take Lot as, as a captive. Verse 13, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Honor. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, Dan, of course, is not born yet, because who is Dan? Son of Jacob. Jacob is not born yet either. And furthermore, even though neither Jacob nor Dan are born, it's going to be much, much longer before that land is given to Dan. In fact, it's not even given to Dan, the son of Jacob. It's given to the tribe of Dan, who descends from Dan, the son of Jacob. Right? So it would be like talking about um, the, 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 the Narragansett tribe living in Massachusetts. Right? It's not Massachusetts yet. It will become Massachusetts, right? Or the Comanche living in New Mexico. It's not New Mexico yet. It will become New Mexico. So it's, it's the land of Dan. That is, it's the land that will become the land given to Dan, finally in the book of Joshua. And even then, at the end of the book of Joshua. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hoba, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So, Abram, it would have been really tempting, really easy for him to say, well, you know, he picked where he wanted to live and he lived in the place where the king got into a beef with, uh, with the East Coast kings. And, you know, uh, what can I do? I've got herdsmen, I've got, I've got people to feed. Uh, but what does Abram do? Yeah, he pursues them. He goes and he kills the, the, the captors who took Lot. So Abram is, he's rich, he's generous, and he's also, yeah, he's, he's fierce, he's brave, he's selfless. Yeah, he has 318 servants trained for war. So he has his own personal army. But you know, if you've got huge wealth, <laughs> herds, um, servants, they're going to need defended. And so he goes in pursuit. He goes by night. Why by night? Yeah. Right? It's, it's strategic. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.